So when we're talking about buying money today, everyone's talking about the sky is falling. So what's kind of changed and what hasn't changed in raising financing? And the reason I call it buying money is because it's kind of like a weird play on words, but you're actually selling your shares because no one else will take them. Your team doesn't want your stock, your landlord doesn't want your stock, Safeway doesn't want your stock, but they like cash. So what you're actually trying to do is trade your stock to get cash. Because once you've got cash, please take cash. So with what's kind of happening right now in the world, everyone's been pinched. I've got, I think, 13 or 14 companies right now that I'm one of the early seed investors or one of the majority shareholders. And I can tell you that just over Christmas, I got two Christmas presents, huge down rounds, and some of the companies I've been invested in for greater than five years. So one of my portfolio companies went down from seven figures to six figures over Christmas. That automatically makes you look at the world differently. So I can talk to myself as an investor, how I felt over Christmas. And I'm not even like a big investor compared to some other people. So you can imagine how everyone's portfolio is feeling, whether they're in private equity or in the public markets. These articles are both from Monday. Angels flee from tech startups. Venture capital returns dip below zero. So officially, in the last quarter, VCs returned negative returns to their portfolio. And turns out a lot of angels are just in a sense, getting out of the market. It's not like they don't have their cash and stuff anymore, but they're kind of not sure what's gonna happen. I'm gonna start with what hasn't changed, and then I'll go to what has changed. Generally, there's always these principles of raising financing, which I don't think change. Avon was really kind, we're saying not everyone always agrees with me at CTI, it's just because I'm, I've always said I'm the chief opinion officer, and I'm not always right, but I think that you actually have to have like a strong, bright line on how you approach this stuff, and that's one of the, the tips that I'll give, because if you actually have a gray line on how you approach how you're gonna finance, it turns out that no one can get excited by you. You're basically vanilla ice cream. Everyone's kind of excited, sure they'll have it, but it's not, no one's getting jazzed up enough to write a check. There's a lot of truth to this quote, right? You can replace men with women, it's the same thing. At the end of the day, when you're actually raising financing, you're getting someone absolutely seduced and in love with what you're doing. There's all these techniques on how you can get them in love with you, and I know that you can learn that stuff from financing your vision, but at the end of the day, this is actually what's happening. What I also want to talk about was that it's very hard. If you sit and you read the newspaper, every single thing seems like everyone's getting their financing done, all this stuff is just so easy. Another VC round goes in, maybe angels do a deal, because that's stuff people talk about, right? Just like if you have a friend that makes it to the NHL, automatically they're gonna be talked about. If you have a friend that's hit by lightning, automatically they're gonna be talked about. It's a very, very, very rare event. Raising financing, especially if you're talking about VCs versus angels, there's an old quote, raising venture capital is like standing on a sunny day in an empty pool and getting hit by lightning, and some people think that might be too optimistic. It's hard. The one thing that I've always been about is just more like you have to have to say, hey, I'm gonna go raise this financing, no matter what happens. So that's the bright line test that I use for myself. But at the end of the day, it's very, very hard to get people to get excited to raise checks. It gets easier though, when you're in certain quadrants of what's going on. This first axis here is your capital efficiency. And that means that like you're all the way to market for less than $25 million. So think about that. You're all the way to market with less than 25 million. That's like the definition of capital efficient from VCs. And then you've got how fast your business can scale. So you can imagine the not sweet spot is that your business doesn't scale very fast at all and you're very, very capital intensive. Compare that to down in this quadrant. You're very capital efficient and you scale very fast. Take an example, and I hate using examples like this, but take like a social networking example, like Facebook or something. Obviously, it can scale very, very fast. If you think about a social network, it's basically a magazine. It's a magazine, but the next part about the magazine is I don't have to hire writers to actually have great story pieces and then sell ads on the side. The people inside the social network basically generating all their own local news amongst their own friends. You start to look inside any social network that takes off, you're like, oh wow, you're a magazine that can serve a billion page views a day. Now you're getting a billion eyeballs looking at your content, and you didn't even have to write the content, you're selling ads that are on the side. Very, very fast to scale, you know, how fast did Facebook scale is an example, right? And still very capital efficient. They've raised lots of money, so they're going after stuff, but comparatively, still very capital efficient. Imagine something that scales pretty fast, capital intense, take Intel. Lots of people weren't buying processors like crazy, but you first have to lay out a couple billion dollars for your manufacturing plant. 
you compare Facebook's all their big raises, like their $240 million raise at a $15 billion valuation, that's an amazing valuation for a firm. And yes, it's $240 million that they put in kind of post already kind of winning that first success. Imagine Intel deciding to back a microprocessor company. You're like, well, to get into this game, we first have to put in $1 billion to make the manufacturing plan before we have any sign if anyone's gonna buy processors. Still, Intel can raise money. On this side of the fence, as soon as your business can scale faster, like there's high demand, it's way easier to raise money. When your business doesn't scale fast, it's almost impossible to raise money. Like you can always get your friends sometimes to back you, do tricks like that, but actually getting um, kind of serious investors is very hard. So imagine something that's very capital efficient that scales very slow, me as an independent consultant. Great little business model, I sell my time. Maybe I'm lucky sometimes, I get 100 bucks an hour. That does not scale at all. I got 2,000 billable hours in a year. I'm super capital efficient. I need, what, a laptop and business cards. No one's gonna fund me to sell my time, ever, right? Other than like my mom. If you can't get yourself to scaling fast, you're not even in the land of raising capital, aside from basically friends, family, and fools, as they say. If you're actually capital intensive and slow, that's a really bad business to be in. So take one of the companies I'm looking at investing in right now, they're live, got a really great low burn rate, but I'm not sure there's, a, there's an efficient way of getting new customers. So because I'm not sure, that's my hesitation, right? It doesn't mean that they can't get those customers when they get those customers, they're in there, but I don't want to spend $1,000 a customer. We have to get it down to like $2 to get a new lead, maybe $50 to get a new customer into their business. At the end of the day, it really only comes down to like one thing, you. People will rationalize why they're gonna make an investment or rationalize why they're not gonna make an investment. It's your job to seduce that person to basically invest in you. All this stuff around the sides, tips, techniques, tricks or whatever, but at the end of the day, they're coming down to looking at you. What I'm interested in is investing in people. And Arthur Rock's one of the fathers of venture capital on the West Coast, seed investor in Apple, seed investor in Intel. Why do you care so much about me as a person? Because that's the only thing that doesn't change. Four to five companies that are successful aren't successful with what they started with. Flickr was a massive multi on player game, now it's photo sharing. YouTube was a webcam dating site, now it's obviously a platform for sharing video. In fact, out of the successful companies, 80% of them aren't successful with what they started on. So anyone that's even looked at the stats goes, okay, so the one thing I know that won't change is the person that I'm investing in. They're the actual constant through the business. Is that a horse, quote unquote, that you actually want to bet on? Probably, your business is gonna change, your market's gonna change, your product's gonna change, all those things are probably gonna change. You can actually say that quite truthfully. From a financing standpoint, there's something called the animal test. Can you actually say the person that you're gonna invest in's name and then add is an animal? And if it makes you laugh when you say that person's name through the animal test, you probably shouldn't invest in them. I mean, whatever you can gauge that by myself, I always give guys I'm gonna invest in homework. I see how fast they get it done. If they're slow on their homework, I'm like, I don't know if they can pass my own personal animal test. If you're having a hard time saying it about yourself, it means you gotta gear it up, because that's how, that's how an investor is actually gonna look at you. This is something that hasn't changed. You have to live on scraps. You want to be the strongest species that will live through anything to eat the worst food. And that's basically the greatest sin is running out of cash. You're always alive until you're out of money. Be a cockroach and get your burn rate down to the absolute lowest possible. Do all those things then you're actually gonna live the longest. How frugal can you run your business? There's an early seed investor called Y Combinator out of the Valley, and they've got, here's a classic story, two guys started a site called Ticket Stumbler. They figured out a way on $15,000 in seed capital to get to a profitable business. You have to ask, what does it mean to be a profitable business? Two guys, I think they're in one apartment, Raymond noodle diet, but now they're sustainable. They're not trying to go raise big rounds of financing. They're totally making sure that they can get through with almost nothing. So 15 grand initial investment, and now they're cash flow positive. It's not huge cash flow positive, but it doesn't matter. Now they're sustainable, which is a trick, right? This again hasn't changed, is that at the end of the day, it's way easier to invest in people that are doing versus talking. Paul Bouchette is the guy who created FriendFeed and also the guy who created Gmail, which most people know, most people don't know about FriendFeed. His concept is communicating with code. He would rather talk to an investor through their product because if you're really good at PowerPoint, you can get people all sucked in by your idea, maybe even raise financing if you've got something like Gmail on your resume that you created, but the doing side is far more important. So you can communicate through your product, then for sure an investor can see that you're capable of doing, hence you're gonna win. This again has always been true. It's even taken me a long time to really understand this. There's basically two models for your startup. 
There's the customer development model and the product development model. So many people, especially if they have a large chunk of financing, default into the product development model, which is why there's so many sins created when people get too much financing. You do things like this. Well, we've got a great idea. We've got it funded. We'll do the product. We'll get people to test it. And then we'll ship it and start selling it. This left to right path makes the absolute most sense. And especially when you've got financing, you can actually hire. If you're a marketing person, you start looking at this, you're going, okay, if I'm marketing, product development, over here I probably need to do Marcom, PR activities, we're getting ready to ship. If you're a salesperson, over here you're now figuring out who's gonna be my VP of sales. The thing is, if you go back to all the stats, this is almost never true. If four of the five successful companies didn't start with the right product, how does this ever work? Generally, it doesn't. This is from a book called Four Steps to Epiphany. How I just kind of sum it up quick is there's company discovery. What are we actually going to do? And then there's company building. And when you're doing company discovery, the entire team needs to fit in a phone booth. If it can't, something's wrong already. I've done this wrong myself. What you need to have while you're doing basically discovery, validation, and creation. Obviously, between discovery and validation, you can keep looping. And see there's a big stop symbol on all that stuff? Most companies start with a hypothesis of their market, especially when you have a new product to a new market and you're segmenting in a new way, there is no more risk that you can take as an investor. So you as an entrepreneur need to be able to articulate, okay, we have a function of a new product, we're in a function to a new market, we're gonna segment in a new way, that means we have risk multiplied by risk multiplied by risk, so that's why we're for sure gonna follow this. The reason why so many people fall into this trap is that if you've ever worked for a large company, lots of times you're releasing not a new product, not to a new market. You're releasing features on an existing product. Perhaps a new product to an existing market, your existing customer base. Completely different way of operating those projects. What you're selling is no longer a hypothesis. Most startups, it's a hypothesis of what you're trying to do. You've thought about it, you've written a business plan, you seem unbelievably brilliant, but at the end of the day, it's gonna be a hypothesis, especially if it's a new product to a new market, it is for sure. Right now, obviously, financing's gonna be extra tight. The nice part about that, almost no one's gonna be able to screw this up. Planning in the fourth quarter of 09, we need to hire a Marcom person because you haven't actually proven that you can actually consistently create customers yet. The nice part about what's gonna go on is no one's gonna accidentally screw up and drop into the product development methodology right now because capital's so tight and most people are gonna be forced to be up here. And whether they realize they're following this model or not, you are if you're a successful startup. My first interesting startup was Servidium and because we had no idea what we were doing, we had no idea how to raise financing, I was absolutely terrified of it because I'm not a business guy, I'm a software guy, we actually were in this model. You can call it a bootstrapping model, you can call it whatever you want, but you're basically in this model, small and nimble, figuring out what your customers are gonna be. You can't drop down to this model and say, well, I have $2 million in my seed round, so now I can just go hire people and we just tick this through, tick, 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 tick. You can't even do that when you're in bootstrapping mode. So there is benefits to that. There's an actual great benefit of what's happening right now is that the number of people that are gonna drop down here and screw up like I did will be less. If you eventually drop down here and do this, you go, whoa, I'm wrong. And you have to go back up anyways. Creativity loves constraints, so you naturally work your way back up to the customer development model because you run out of cash and you're wrong. Winning and what hasn't changed, there's still a function of so many things. The function of your product to a function of a market and how you're entering that market, all those things are there. Even from an investor, I really, really, really care about talking about your exit strategy, but you want to blow me away, you talk about your entrance strategy. You have an entrance strategy into a marketplace and you actually can actually articulate it and you actually have numbers like, I know that I can run any marketing campaign if it's $2 or less per user. And that's why I'm using radio, I start to get really impressed. You're still gonna get it wrong, probably if you're not doing the customer development methodology, but if you're focusing on the entrance, then guess what you've got? You're right back to customer discovery, validation, creation. You're basically doing that whole thing. How am I entering this market versus how I'm exiting? Because one thing I can tell you is that I had no idea how to sell a company when I sold my first company. How would I? I'm not an MBA guy, never went to business school, software guy, total software geek. That's what happens. You have a business that has value, that's doing stuff that's interesting, you automatically are gonna get an acquisition offers. Even Cambrian House, we got our first acquisition offers in the first five months because people were like afraid of what we were gonna do, right? They're like, we should buy you out early. So we didn't take it obviously, but that's the whole point. If you actually have something of value, people will buy it. Like it's not weird for me to say, go to Kijiji or eBay and sell my 24 series of DVDs because this show's popular. I'm not worried. It's not like this magical event that 
I'm so lucky that someone's going to come to my house and buy my 24 TV series because there's already a market for it, right? Same thing with your business. An acquisition event is actually nothing special. The special part is that you actually have something of value. And that's why I don't worry so much about exits. I worry more about, if you imagine that analogy of you're in an elevator going up to the penthouse, where you get really screwed up is when you're in between two floors. No one's gonna pay for what you think you could do if you could get to the next floor solidly and get out of the elevator, because you're stuck. So there's some type of emergency crew that needs to get in to either push you down or lift you up. So your value is always wrong. And if you're stuck too low in the building, of course you're not gonna acquire. You haven't figured out enough. You have to basically get to a high enough level in the penthouse, because otherwise it's not interesting to buy you. Obviously, all this stuff is cyclical, right? When I, for example, raised money for Cambridge House, it was a perfect time from a cycle standpoint, again, to be raising money for tech. Dot-com had blown up 2,000. There's still guys who are super passionate, create companies. All of a sudden, the cycles come turning around. Then you start hearing the exits, the exits in 2003, the exits in 2004. Oh, yeah, com big companies are buying tech again. Oh, it's hot you can go raise money. So we raised a lot of money because we were on the right side of the cycle. That actually led us towards a product development methodology, which hurts. We spent way more money than we needed to because we had to work our way back up to customer development. But at the end of the day, this is all cyclical. So right now, if anyone who's basically going to be in a startup in tech, it's not going to be easy money. Everyone's going to be talking about the sky is falling. All the media is going to be about layoffs and all that stuff. If you can actually be a cockroach and get through it, you can actually now be the early exits on the next wave. You'll be the early exits to get out. It's not like it's not gonna come back, all right? So Bill Gates thinks it's gonna come back kind of 2011, 2012. So it's gonna be a couple years, but that's what it takes to build up a company anyway. It's an interesting point. These things, you could consider them both true. So let's talk about what has changed. I haven't started a restaurant right now, but I think it's scary right now. In scary economic times, people are pinched, going out to eat and stuff. That's, I probably didn't start a restaurant, but technology is kind of independent. Microsoft and Apple both started in the 70s with a huge recession going on. It doesn't really matter. Microsoft built BASIC for the Altair as their first product. There was the Altair computer. Someone needed to write a programming language for that. That's literally independent of the economy. So people are more towards technology. It's actually an okay time for us. It's scary. I'm not going to say it's not scary, it's not hard, but it's okay time because generally with the technology, it's not, it's not at these whims. In fact, sometimes companies can be so pinched that this is a time you can say, for example, move them to software as a service. It's cheaper. We don't want to pay those SQL Server licenses. We don't want to pay those Oracle licenses. Moving to software as a service. For the same reason you can be really scared right now and companies can be really scared, they're actually going to be motivated to now buy your new product, especially on tech, biotech, all that stuff. Valuations of your business are down. It's like when Facebook says, I raised $240 million at $15 billion. That's, that's, like, that's their pre-money number, right? So when anyone's ever raising financing, there's their pre-money and their post-money. And when you're talking to an investor, if you can quote your pre-money and your post-money, they automatically be like, I like dealing with you because now I know how much you're valuing yourself at, and how much you're raising, because I can subtract those two numbers, and now I know what the percent that I'm buying. It's just a fast way of communicating that. Valuations are down, but you're just not getting raised as much money. Valuations in startups are always black art, but there's one simple trick for it. If it's kind of less than 10%, you're not going to be able to raise money. If it's more than 40, you're hurting yourself, and any good investor won't let you do it to yourself anyways. So most deals end up wiring between 20 and 40% of the company anyways. If I'm raising a million bucks, that tells me what my pre-money valuation is. So what's happens with the valuations being crammed down right now is that they're so crammed down because there is less capital. If there's less capital, if I can only raise 300 grand, well, it still has to be at least 10% of my company. It still has to be maybe 20% of my company. So automatically, the dollar signs that are being injected into the business start dictating this, not the other way around, right? It's the fact that the dollars are pinched are gonna drop the valuations down. The other part I want to mention here is about taking your cookies. It's an old saying, but it's so true. When the plate of cookies comes by you, you should take one. So same thing with your company. If someone's willing to invest in you or whatever, you should be leaning on the side of yes, not no, and fighting about this number. Because if you need the cash, you should be thinking about it. If you're asking to raise money, you think you need the money, you're hungry, take your cookie right now. Don't wait for that plate to come by. And that's especially true right now. There'd be less and less people that are gonna do that with you. Most people should be market cap investors. I should be looking at what your pre-money valuation is before I put my cash in. I add that dollar to get your post money. But people still care about share price. It's like showing a piece of software that's got the most amazing user interface and nothing's hooked up on the server side. Every single person who's an investor in you is completely confused by what you just built. They're like, the whole thing looks done. Why do you need my money for a year? It's beautiful. Now start explaining that there's magic behind the scenes, all this magic plumbing that has to go on. You're actually better off to show a napkin with a scratched out user interface 
in the beginning because you're not misleading people. Same advice I generally do with my stock price. Even though it really shouldn't matter, I've actually found that it does. So it's just like a tip. If your company's new, your stock price should be low. People love to go and they can't help but imagine your stock being worth $10. They can't help. If you're selling your stock to me at $1,000 a share, I can't get as excited about it being worth 10. You are, you rob me of it being worth 10. Now I have to imagine you have a $10,000 stock. Like it's just, people's brains don't work that way, even though it makes no sense. It's like looking at a ticker price in the stock market makes no sense. It's the market cap of the company, but by the time people are investing, by the time you're actually aware enough to understand that you should be a market cap investor, you've had too many years of being conditioned to prices. So as a, from a psychological standpoint, I always make sure my share price matches the state of my company, like my user interface matches the phase I'm in the project. Because if you get them out of whack, people get confused and they don't know why, even though they don't know how to articulate it. I'm talking to a guy out of Germany about this one deal I'm considering investing in. He sold two of his companies, really big exits in the US. His key line to me on the phone was, do we both agree that we have the tremendous courage it's going to take now to do this investment? Because it's a little early. Because almost everyone else is taking their money out of the sidelines. This is a guy that's done so many deals. I've done enough deals. And when we're, when we're phoning around our friends to see if they want to come in with us on another one, all of a sudden everyone's saying, no, they're out, they're out of the market. You have to imagine now, if you are in any position right now of raising financing, doing financing, that whoever you talk to, that quote about seducing older people, older men, you have to make them feel comfortable. You have to make them believe that they should actually leap and take this courage to do an investment. Because on the investor side, they don't have to write the check. They can just wait. Why just wait six months and see if you're still here? Maybe it'll be cheaper. Maybe you'll have hit milestones. People like VCs and stuff almost will never say no to you. It makes no economic sense for them to. Imagine that I want to invest in Greg's company. Would I ever say, no, Greg, I hate you. I hate the way you think. I hate your business plan. I hate all this stuff. Why? I'd be like, I'm, you're a little too early. Come back and visit me in six months. Because if he's actually worked his kinks out, I've been there for him. I've maybe answered one or two questions, maybe done an intro for him. He's got his kinks worked out. Now I'm in before he goes to talk to someone else. There's no economic reason for me to actually tell someone no. Because if he's passionate and he's passing the animal test, I'd best let him just go off and discover what's going to happen because then I can be there and invest alongside when the risk is lower. This courage point right now is super, super true. And I can tell you, even as an investor on my own self, I'm personally feeling it. I'm actually feeling myself have less courage. And I'm probably one of the more optimistic investors that's out there. I'm a bit looser with my investments than I probably should be. The big valuations and stuff, a lot of that money gets wasted because you're stuck in that product development methodology. You haven't even realized that you're in that methodology. This gets investors, helps pump their courage up when they find out that you don't have an office. Awesome. That they have to phone you or talk to you on Skype. I'm like, awesome. Okay, $2.95 a month for unlimited calls. Love those guys. Love finding all those little things inside of a business. So I'm like, these guys are cockroaches. Like, they can totally make it through this period. This guy, Paul, he's the guy who created Gmail and FriendFate has the best quote on advice. Limited life experiences plus overgeneralization equals advice. So take it for what you will, but it's just stuff from one person who's basically been doing this for about 12 years now. I would actually consider other ways of doing financing that you maybe wouldn't have considered five years ago, like a participating preferred share. So what is a participating preferred share? It's just another one of those equity tools that gives you equity, but it basically gives investors a preference. A lot of guys do deals like this all the time, but right now, you're probably gonna have to be more closer to this deal. Like, I couldn't imagine myself investing without a participating preferred stock. The guys that I'm interested in investing in, they didn't have that structure, and I was able to tell them with a nice bright line, no worries, I'm out. If you don't have participating press, I'm out already. And so what does that actually just mean? It just means it's a liquidation preference and a coupon rate. For example, in a deal right now I'd be in, I wouldn't do anything less than a 1x participating preferred. Meaning that if I gave in $100,000, you owe me back always off the top 100,000 plus 6% interest every year. I wouldn't even put my cash in in common stock right now. Some guys are doing participating press at 1.5x. So if I give in 100 grand and you sell the company for 150 grand, I get all the money, you as entrepreneur get nothing. And so sometimes entrepreneurs think that they're double dipping because they participate. So once the preference has been paid off, the, all your participating preferred stock converts to common. And now you, now you also get the other side of the pool. It's really not a big double dip. What it is, it means that if you don't execute against your plan and build up a creative value, it will hurt you. If you actually build up a great business and you build up great value, it's a rounding error. Yes, if I invest in your company tomorrow and you say you're worth $3 million, I give you $300,000 on a participating press structure, you can't go sell it for $3 million. You're going to actually make less. I get my money out first. 
that's something awesome. There's something called venture debt, which is not really that popular in Canada, especially for the younger firms. It's just something to be aware of. It's guys that are willing to do debt. But if you're super early, they're not going to invest in you anyways, because how can you pay off the debt? It's basically really nice loans. I think government programs are amazing. I love the new Alberta voucher program. I love IRAP. We've been so grateful. We've gotten IRAP loans to do some of our research stuff, shred credits. All these programs from the government are honestly amazing. They're totally worth all the work that goes in there because they're not just money. You actually get smart people who are in the industry talking to all these other people along the way. Obviously, that's always been true, but right now, this can actually be some of the only people that have the remaining courage to invest alongside of you. Some of the other angels have fleed, right? There's like an old story about Swiss army guys lost in the Alps or lost for three days, and they get out, and they go see their general. They're like, oh, so happy you guys are alive, we can find you. It's like, no worries, we had this map. And the general looks at the map, and it's like, it's a map of the Pyrenees. That's not the Alps, that's the Pyrenees. It goes, I know, but we had a map. Having like a playbook and giving people like confidence in you in some way, uh, any map's better than none, because you could even just look at the map and say, okay, not the Alps, this is the Pyrenees, but maybe there's something we can learn from this. Maybe there's one piece of data. Sometimes people just having a, a, a tool that's not even useful is enough to make them feel confident. For example, sometimes investors just like to see you have a business plan. I can tell you that the way that we always distribute business plans, financial plans, is through like a web portal, so I can see what people read. And I can tell you that 99% of the time, nobody reads anything. They don't even click on the link. I don't even have to say like, oh, they clicked it once, printed it out, and read it at home. I mean, they don't even click on the link. It's a map. It means that you've gotten and done some homework. It's maybe a false tool of confidence for them. That's how you have to be thinking about anyone who's going to invest in you. What are you giving them? Are you giving them a playbook? Are you giving them a map? Like, what's going to happen here? How are you boosting their confidence in you? And then what I call selling to the old brain. There's this whole concept of the new brain and the old brain. The old brain has evolved for 500 million years. At the end of the day, the way people mostly make decisions is actually with their old brain. The new brain is the stuff in the front, and this is where it's all logic and rational. And down here, this is the stuff on the back. This stuff's not logical and rational. For example, on a business plan, business plan's gonna go one or two ways for you. you. Find the exact reason why you can't invest or exactly find a reason why you can dismiss it. If you love me and I've already seduced you and I give you my business plan and it's full of horribleness, you basically go, so glad I'm here to help this kid because this is so bad. I gotta invest in this kid, right? If for some reason you can't figure out why not to invest in me, haven't seduced you and I hand you my business plan, you'll go, I'm out. Page 18, chart four, that's not the type of curve I like to invest in. Nice, I didn't have to say, I just don't like you, right? This is generally what happens, this art of seduction that's happening anyways. Humans are even more loss averse and more irrational than monkeys. A monkey, basically on an experiment of losing on a gambling bet, is only irrational about two X. They'll over believe that their perceived loss hurts them two X and it really does. We hate loss, right? What mammals do. Humans are like 2.2. Talking to some guys I'm working with, they're talking about buying a laptop. So afraid someone else is going to buy it, they're not willing to negotiate on it. The savings of $100 on negotiating down, the pain of the loss is 2.2 times any potential savings. It starts to hurt more. Once you start realizing that the way people are really going to make these decisions is based on you, their old brain, you have to have all these techniques and stuff, but realizing that if you have a business plan, maybe it's because you're just giving confidence, not because anyone's going to read it. It's just a, fake, a false map anyways, right? I'm kind of like a super fan of bootstrapping, even though I've raised a lot of capital in my life, but I've actually found that the, when I've raised the capital, that's when I've got sucked into the product development side and wasted more. It's on the bootstrapping side, even if you don't have any idea of customer development methodology versus product development methodology, you are forced to be in the right side. Because creativity does constraints, you'll work your way out. You can't use capital to over-hire and believe you can just go left or right on a business. My advice is basically the angel side. The VCs are obviously there, and they get the most quotes, they get the most paper, because they have the biggest funds. But the guys who are going to make the biggest impact, or women, are generally the angels, because they're there in the beginning. You need to get yourself to a quote-unquote series A round, generally before most VCs will get interested in you. And if they're interested in you earlier than that, it's because maybe they've got a matching program from a government or something, and they need to make an investment in Western Canada before it goes away. I'm not saying you can't get those deals, but they're not the right guys. And just kind of one side tip, Series A doesn't mean anything. Series A, it's just like a label that I've given. It basically means by the time I'm at Series A, remember there's that chart customer development methodology, there's basically discovery, 
and then company building. Series A means you know how to build your company. That's what you're supposed to say. When you're Series A, it means you're beyond discovery, you know how to build, hence VCs come in and they give you gas. Take Krispy Kreme donuts. You have one donut store, you don't know how to open up a second, too early for VC. Maybe you got 10 stores and you don't want to roll up 2,000 stores, that's VC. You understand how your customers work, how to segment, how to target them, how to do ads in the local papers, how to keep your costs down. All those things are there, your company building. I actually have always had more appreciation on the angel side than on the VC side. Because the VC guys, some people call them vulture capitalists and terms like that. It's just that they're just harder to seduce because it's their full-time job. It's not some guy who's maybe made some money and, and business. He's kind of bored, semi-retired. He sees some young kids. He's a lot of attributes in this kid that he loves and wants to invest in them. Now he has something exciting to talk about at the dinner table. The VC guys, they're just so much more methodical about what they're doing. In the beginning of your business, it'd be way harder to answer any of their questions. The VC guys get all the stage because they have the biggest funds. Doesn't mean that angel guys don't have just as great quotes, but they're harder to find because they are busy making investments and building companies versus talking about it. But what I love about Arthur Rock is he's always been one of my favorite VCs. At a presentation I gave recently, the audience questions were all along the same lines. How do I get in touch with VCs? What percentage of the equity do I have to give them? None of them ask how to build a business. That's actually what you're trying to do. If you'll talk to entrepreneurs and they're all worried about, oh, if I take money, I've lost control or something. And they don't even realize that once you're raising money, you have to move away from a founder-centered business to an investor-centered model, automatically. You have a board. Founder-centered company, all of a sudden my wife and I are going on a cruise to Hawaii because there's a course there for two hours I want to take and I'm expensing it through the business. It doesn't happen when you take other people's money. These are almost all irrelevant questions. You should be talking to someone that knows how to help build your business. So whether they're an angel or a VC, what you guys should be talking about is how do I build a business, not how expensive is your money to my equity. Because as an investor, I still can't really screw around with you. If I have any smarts, if I do, you're gone. All of a sudden, in the nightmares that occur in businesses, if you don't own enough of it, you're not going to be there. And most VCs and most angel investors are actually not looking to become the CEO of your firm in general. Of course, there's all horror stories of stuff that happens. You know, people will steal your ideas, people will steal your money, people will give you bad investments. Of course, that's all true. Some people, when they're driving to work, get murdered. It's horrible, it's gross. I don't mean to talk about it in a glib way, but it doesn't happen very often. You can't live your life on those parameters. You have to get up, drive, go to work. So when you're trying to secure capital, these are the questions you should be talking to whoever's gonna invest in you, not these questions. How are we gonna do this together? Do you like any of my ideas? And one of the biggest sins that I see of entrepreneurs make is that they're all like, they're smart enough to know this quote, and they're smart enough to say that they don't want just me, they're looking for smart money and you hear all this stuff, but then you can just go and you just test it. What of my ideas have you implemented? None, why do you need me? So you give a bit of homework, none of your ideas are implemented, you should be out. They're just basically telling you this quote because they're looking for your cash. You don't want to even be invested in that company, especially if you're an angel because you have a smaller portfolio that you have to win on, right? Whenever you're dealing with these guys, just do your homework on the language, right? I went to the Vancouver Angel Forum. It was an awesome show. I love the Vancouver Angel Forum. I was there raising financing, and we raised finance. We raised $700,000. So from landing, $700,000, it was a Tuesday, sorry, to a Friday, the checks were given to us. But I walked around the room because I'm also still an investor, and I'm asking every single person, what's your pre-money... What's your share price? The reason I even get to post money is that zero people can answer my pre-money question, which I imagine means that zero can answer the post money, which means that zero can answer the share price. Zero. So now as an investor, I have to go and educate you on all your deals. People will give you $25,000 as a bet. I'll bet on you, here's 25. I think it's way more rare right now. We're gonna have to wait a couple years to get that. But by not being able to answer those questions and know the language, automatically, when I walked around that room, let's say I had 25 grand, then I'm willing to give five guys five grand, because I don't care. I don't want to give you advice, I don't care. I'm just basically saying, here's five grand each. It's the cheapest money you ever get. 15 minutes, a check, subscription agreement, move on. Great, as an investor, love those deals. For 15 minutes of work, that's a great hourly rate. But you can't answer that question, now I have to get married to you. And guess what, most of the guys don't want to, they don't want to get married that fast. No one does, because now I have to come and I have to fly to Vancouver, I have to figure that stuff out. So it's just something to think about as an entrepreneur. I put huge error bars on this because I think it's so scary. I did my first angel investment when I was 24. Because I figured I love this space so much, it's gonna take me a long time to get experience, so I better get into it early. It's really scary because 
generally when you're young, you have to lie. You can't even be an angel investor, so you have to actually commit a lie. Yes, I have $1 million in liquid assets because you have to uh, have to pass National Instrument 4105 because otherwise you can't invest in it. It's so risky. But you actually start learning a lot as soon as you're on the opposite side. As soon as you're on the other side saying, hey, I have $100,000 to start my company, here's 50 for an investment, here's 50 for me. Imagine now when you actually have to give away half of your runway to another person you're investing in, how all of a sudden everything changes. It totally changes. Your whole outlook on investing changes and you get way smarter, right? So I'm not saying anyone else should do that. I'm just saying that I know, for example, for me, I learned a lot. If this is true for you, that your product or your business must come out of you regardless, then for sure it doesn't matter what the, what's going on with the economy. Beethoven did not care if piano music was commercially viable or not at the time he was composing. If this is true from an advice standpoint, then for sure you should do for sure, always, right? And then I just want to have any questions. So you talk about the free money and the post money, suppose that is good stuff, but you also have to compose your story to justify for that free money and post money. What are the strategies for you? Like, how am I going to get excited about what you're doing? If you're earlier on, it's more about what you're doing with that capital. I don't really care what you're asking. I'm just going to be like, whoa, that's a lot of money, or that's not a lot of money. When it's not a lot of money, you, you stop asking questions what you're going to be doing with it, because you're like, oh, so there's two guys who are raising 100 grand. Okay, so I'm basically paying you to develop the product. That's all you're going to get done. You don't even have to ask you any questions. Well, there's a couple guys who are raising a million bucks. What are you doing with that? The most important part of that story is your use of funds. I put that in quotes because I'm trying to get my head around how you're getting yourself through the terrain. The amount of money that you're raising, I can't let it be more than 40% of your company, and it's not going to be less than 10. We can fight in between those two ranges all we want, but I know I'm not going to go over 40 because you're the one who has to carry this heavy bag, not me. And if I go under 10, why am I in? I don't own enough. Automatically, we're only fighting in the middle of there. And the better answers that you get, the more that you get towards 10 and 20s, the worse answers that you get, the more I push you towards 40. That's all I do as, a, as an investor myself. We can't value this stuff. There's no like business with discounted cash flow. It's all made up, especially early on. As businesses are obviously old and mature, discounted cash flow, enterprise value, all this stuff makes sense. How do you do that on, there's a couple guys, there's a product, there's no sales. Actually, your amount that you're raising and what you're doing with it tells me the valuation. That's where you get the number from. Let's say you want to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that is honest. There's no technique to value your business. If your business is doing so well that you're, I can actually uh, do discounted cash flow and stuff on you, then you're at a different level. You're probably doing $10 million a month. At $10 million a month, I don't even know why you're talking about this. You can go get a book from McKinsey. It's the greatest book ever written on valuation. It's literally called Valuation by McKinsey. That's a book. Unfortunately, for probably every single person in this room, it does not apply. If I was a McKinsey consultant, how do I walk into a multi-billion dollar company and decide to buy another multi-billion dollar company? There is a lot of known art and known science there. I'm an angel investor, I made a little bit of money. You have a product idea, you have no idea how you're gonna get it to market. How do we value the company? It's actually, show me how you're gonna use the funds. If I think your use of funds is amazing and I'm excited, then I can help put more money in. If I think your use of funds is really scary and really dangerous, I'll be like, you only get 50 grand. It's not about lying or a trick or a technique. There is no methodology, there is none. If I'm asking you questions as you go up the elevator and I just can't buy them and there's no testing of the hypothesis and how you can go back down to a floor if you get it wrong, I'm already not gonna believe in your roadmap. A map's important, like the guys, the Swiss Army that was lost, any map was better than no map, but unfortunately, like I'm gonna put huge air bars in your map. If someone comes to me and they show me how they're going up through the penthouse diagram and there's all these hypotheses, they actually were like hypothesis, assumption, tests that must be proven before we can go up the next floor, I'm gonna be like, okay, I love this person. That's actually what we're doing. We're actually not being confident. I'm not, I can't come out to you and say, okay, this is how you start a company. You say this, you do this, and by fourth quarter we have this, and then Q1 the next year we have this. I can't say that. I can say, these are the things that I hope are true, but I'm not sure. I'm testing about our market. I can acquire a member with Google AdWords for no more than $2.50. Is that true? I don't know. Go test it. Oh crap, it's two seventy five. dollars Should we be in business? Yes, no. Google or uh, sorry, Skype and all those types of things. Uh, I was interested in that point. What you're looking for then, or what you think probably most uh, most angel type investors are looking for, is somebody who has that uh, that burn rate down, and so no office. Having the office and stuff is all fake. One guy that I've in, I've invested in, 
he like was working full time while he was building his company. So some investors are saying, anyone who doesn't believe in themselves, how can I believe in that guy? They're just not seduced. So okay, so watch this. You say that to me, he quits his job, how fast does he have a check? So I, I go back and I negotiate between the, the entrepreneur and the new investor. So I'm saying, I'm in. So you're not in because he's working full time, but he's yet he's built up an awesome business. So he's gonna quit sometime, but he's a cockroach, so he doesn't wanna waste any money. So you're telling me, you promise you're gonna give him a check for 100 grand when he quits his job. Uh, no. It's not true. You can always negotiate through those things. You always can just set up one simple line sentences with one piece of paper that remove all those problems because you'll find out that no one's gonna invest anyways. If I'm not investing in you because you figured out how to keep a job and build up a company, I'm not investing in you because there's something else going on that I, even I don't know how to articulate. Sorry, I give long answers. Mm -hmm.